Welcome to the program today. My name is Mono Gonzalez, and I'm here with a special guest, Dr. Titus Kennedy, who is a field archaeologist and actually has just written a brand new book, just hot off the press, called Excavating the Evidence for Jesus, the Archaeology and History of Christ and the Gospel. So welcome, Titus. Thank you, Mondo. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, this, is, uh, this book was excellent, and I, I told you before that I think this is going to become really a classic book in all that you've done. But before we get into that, for our audience, you know, if you, if you think about archaeology and, and how fun it is, it's awesome. And uh, I'm, I'm amazed, honestly, maybe you can give us some insight. Um, talking to you, how did you keep your faith? I mean, you know how it is. It's a very secular environment, sometimes hostile to the, certainly the biblical gospel and the biblical uh, view of inspiration and fallibility. I mean, kind of share a little bit about that. So for me, looking into the history of the Bible and archaeological discoveries that connect to the Bible, I was constantly seeing evidence that the Bible is historically reliable. The archaeology is demonstrating its accuracy. So even though there were a lot of professors and colleagues and other students and, of course, things in documentaries and articles and books that were criticizing the Bible and saying it's just myth or it's just religious propaganda. That's not what I was seeing when I was studying it. And I also understood that there was a difference in worldview. Mm -hmm. That secular critical side of the Bible is coming from the worldview that God does not exist, or at least the God of the Bible is not true. And, and that the Bible is not reliably, reliable historically. It's propaganda or, or it's just spiritual mm -hmm. fairy tales. So they're going to be looking through the lens of that for everything and trying to find whatever they can in order to justify that position. Whereas I was coming from the perspective that the Bible is true and God is real and that if he is, then these things that are written in the Bible happened, and, and we should expect to at least find some evidence of that, and indeed we do. So you kind of have a clashing of worldviews and a different way of looking at the data, and although I may have been getting the other side pushed on me a lot, again, that's not what I was seeing as far as the evidence goes, mm -hmm. and so it actually helped my faith to become stronger because I was looking into all these criticisms and I was looking for the evidence. Let's talk about the, the role of faith. I mean, in the sense that, you know, for those of you that, again, that study and, and love evidence, I know that I, I'm that way. And, um, but God hasn't given us the answers to everything. Certainly every last place mentioned in the scripture or in this particular book in the gospels has been excavated uh, thoroughly, not that it probably ever could be, but how does the role of faith come to play, really tag team along with archaeology? So as you said, archaeology doesn't have all the answers. It hasn't discovered everything, nor will it. We do have a lot of information from archaeology, and more and more is coming up all the time. But you get to a point where you have to accept some things on faith, and that faith can be based on evidence and reasonable thinking, but there's really nothing in this world that you can take without any faith whatsoever. And, and the Bible shows itself to be reliable in, in where we're able to test it and where we've been able to compare things. And so I think we have a very strong case. The Bible's reliable, but we still have to have that component of faith because not everything is going to be uh, an object right in front of us that is telling us, yes, this, for every word, every sentence. You know, Scripture tells us in Hebrews eleven six that, you know, without faith it's impossible to please God, you know, and uh, we must believe that He exists and He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And so when we think about that, God will always demand some level of faith because that is what pleases Him. And now He doesn't call us to a blind faith. I think some, some religions will do that, and, and, uh, and God isn't that way. Right, yeah, 1 Peter 3.15, Peter talks about how we should have reasons for what we believe, 
and we should be able to defend our faith. And, and God has provided us with many reasons and ways that we can defend the faith. Part of that is history and archaeology. Other might be fulfilled prophecy. Mm -hmm. Other is just logical. And then we have the Bible's coherency itself mm -hmm. as some examples. But yes, as you said, there are things we're always going to have to take on faith. You know, as we think about that, I mean, Titus mentioned that that's one of the reasons why we talk about archaeology a lot here. Uh, certainly not more than prophecy, because we are the prophecy watchers, but in some regard, we, we felt that it was very logical to bring the two topics together, because uh, as, as we try to reach people with the gospel, uh, we use prophecy to show them the reliability of the prophets, certainly all through the Old Testament, and uh, the utmost prophet would be Jesus himself, and as we wait for his second coming, and so, to, again, the goal is evangelism. The goal is to win people for, to the gospel. And, and so certainly archaeology helps that, and prophecy does as well. Um, we did another program on your other book, the, the 101 um, Archaeological Discoveries That Bring the Bible to Life. Uh, you did that one recently. You, but you have this new book out. Kind of share uh, the difference between what the old book did and what this, this new one does. Unearthing the Bible, my previous book, was focused on artifacts or objects. So I go through a little over 100 artifacts that connect to the Bible, and that goes through biblical history chronologically, starting in Genesis and going all the way through the New Testament and Revelation. Whereas this book focuses just on Jesus and the Gospels. So it's this very short period of time, but I try to go through all of the archaeological material that is connected to the life of Jesus. You know, it's important when you think about, um, maybe we should do that, because um, what, what entails the elements of archaeology, material cultural? Kind of talk a little bit about the different elements that present a narrative of a culture. So at an archaeological site, depending on how people live there, we, we may have multiple layers or levels or strata of this a city or a town. So people living there in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and the Babylonian period and the Roman period. And then within each of those layers, you're going to have a distinct material culture. So the pottery is going to be different. Artifacts will be different. Architecture is going to be different. Oftentimes, the, the script of the language that they're using, even the language could be different in those time periods. And so we have all these different types of physical materials that we're discovering that point to a, a specific time period and culture from which we can learn more about that city. And you think about it, when we read the Bible, I mean, we're reading it in, in, in I would say, 2D, you know, where it's a... It's a piece of paper, it's black and white, it's letters. Um, you might have some maps, that, that's certainly helpful, but there's, there's place names in there, there's people's names, it talks about they went into this house, they were on this street. So you have, I mean, geography, you have what they ate. I mean, does archeology span tell us about what people ate? It does, it does if we look into that. So we would excavate things like their garbage pit mm -hmm. or their storage jars where they put olive oil or different seeds that they were using. So all this can be analyzed and we can see what kind of crops they were growing and what their diet consisted of and where they got water from and what kind of activities they were doing for their job, their commerce or industry, and the clothes that they were wearing and the everyday items that they were using. So. Yeah, we can learn about all of that from archaeology. I mean, archaeology is, is awesome and fun, and I mean, it provides that, that three-dimensional window as best as we can into the world of the Bible, and uh, that's what I think what, what's so awesome about your book. But we're going to take a little break here so you can learn more about our magazine where uh, we will have archaeology topics in there, some of the latest things that are coming out of the ground. And so stick around. Every day, the ancient prophecies of the Bible get more and more exciting as we watch world events come into perfect alignment with the words of the ancient prophets. Examine the pre-trib rapture doctrine taught by the Apostle Paul. Come to a deeper understanding of the giants of Genesis 6 
and the real reason for the flood of Noah. Read the shocking things we see coming out of the world of science and technology, mind-blowing advances in transhumanism and artificial intelligence. We have a very special subscription offer for you today. For your gift of $50 or more to support the worldwide outreach of Prophecy Watchers, you can subscribe to either the digital version or the print version of our magazine. And here's the best part. In addition to receiving 12 monthly issues of the magazine, this offer comes with a fantastic bonus. Eight DVDs from some of the leading prophecy experts in the world today. Eight DVDs plus 12 issues of the magazine represents a $200 value. But it's available today for your gift of just $50 or more to support the work of Prophecy Watchers. This offer is available anywhere in the USA and will ship both the magazine and the DVDs absolutely free. Don't wait or hesitate. Call the toll-free number on your screen or visit our online bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv to take advantage of this limited time offer. Looking at the future through the lens of Bible prophecy is the entire focus of this ministry. We're motivated like never before by our desire to tell the world that Jesus is the only answer for these troubling times. And we do believe that he's coming back very soon, just as he promised. Partner with us today. Help us take God's message of salvation through Jesus Christ to the whole world. Well, before the break, uh, we were just talking about the role of archaeology. So let's kind of get into it. As Here you, you specifically limited it to the Gospels. And um, you began really chronologically uh, talking about the, what I liked about what you did here is, and why I think that in, if anybody ever wants to take a class on the Gospels, I think this will be the book because you talked about the people. You talked about, again, what they wore, where they lived, how they acted, their religion, the, po the politics. I mean, you really gave a full gamut, but then you were also able to bring in not only archaeology, but you brought in the other historical records, which I thought was extremely valuable. Uh, let's talk about the, the, the first thing here, the birth of Jesus, Bethlehem, and the Magi. I mean, kind of give us an overview of that. So at the beginning of the book, I actually start before the birth of Jesus to give us the context and the setting of the world into which he is born. So this is the Roman Empire. Judea was a client kingdom ruled by Herod the Great, but he is under the authority of the Romans at that time. Augustus is the emperor. And so that sets the stage. And then we have the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. And so I talk about the church of the nativity and the connection that it has to the birthplace of Jesus and some of these historical memories, what was built there before. For example, Hadrian had a shrine to Adonis built at that mm -hmm. point. And, and he actually had Roman temples and shrines built at multiple places associated with historical events in the life of Jesus. For example, at the tomb of Jesus and at the pool of Bethesda. And so this was part of his campaign to either erase the historical memory of Christianity or to actually syncretize Christianity into Roman religion by associating those places with the gods of the Roman pantheon. You know, it's interesting that, um, you know, a lot of these, these, can you imagine a Roman uh, emperor having an ego problem? I mean, <laughs> no doubt. And so you, you see, what I found interesting was the way that you developed it um, in that, again, what was their motive? We don't really know. Were they trying to s stamp out Christianity or show the supremacy of their religious system above Jesus' claim? Because Jesus is Lord, right? I mean, Caesar is Lord. So you, you had this battle. But then you see ultimately with uh, Constantine coming around and building a lot of these places as well, um, Jesus triumphed, didn't he? I mean, in the sense. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in the first century, there, there was a lot of, uh, there were unknowns about Christianity in the Roman Empire, and they started to learn more about it, and Christianity spread, and more and more people became Christians, and then there was some persecution that was happening, sometimes locally and then empire-wide, and then in the second century, you know, that continued to increase, but Hadrian, who we were talking about earlier, he saw that physical persecution wasn't working, so he took a different tactic. And he was very Hellenistic in his mindset and the philosopher type of Caesar. And so he thought first he could argue with the Christians and convince them that 
Roman or, or Greek polytheism was correct. He, he didn't have any success with that, and so his next tactic seemed to have been getting rid of the memory of mm -hmm. Christianity you know, or putting Roman propaganda, so to speak, that all oh, this wasn't associated with Jesus, it was associated with Asclepius or with Adonis or with Jupiter and so forth. You know, when you think about, again, what evil people mean for evil, uh, God intends for good. And so what's the irony here in the sense of these, <laughs> these emperors going around putting something? To talk, talk about the irony. I, I think that Hadrian actually helped to preserve the locations mm -hmm. of many of these events in the life of Jesus by doing that. Because he comes around, and this is in the, the area of 130 to 135 AD, so it's quite early. There are second generation Christians still alive at this time, and they know where these events happen because Bethlehem's a tiny village. Jerusalem was, by our standards, a small town. Mm -hmm. And oh, it just happened down the street here. Mm -hmm. And my grandpa told me that he was around when this happened or he knew the location. So instead of it sort of getting built over by random houses and people sort of losing the idea of where it was, he helped preserve it by building a very specific temple at these different locations. And then when Constantine sends his mother and his architect there to build some of these churches and, and commemorate the sites, preserve the memory, it's even easier for them because they just ask the, the local church leaders and Christians where this happened. Oh yeah, Hadrian had a temple built here, so all you have to do is disassemble that and then you can build the church there. Yeah. And you, and you could see even in modern excavations where, you know, you look at some of these places and you can go down through the layers and you can get to the original Roman structures, right? Yeah, absolutely. So the, in the tomb of Jesus, for example, National Geographic recently financed a, re, not reconstruction, but a reconditioning of the tomb of Jesus in, in the building around it, the edicule, it's called in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And one of the things they did was they removed that marble slab that's in the interior there. And when they removed that, they saw the original limestone burial bench that had been carved in the tomb. So there's an example of a structure that's from the first century still. Or like at the Pool of Bethesda, when that was excavated and you go underneath the shrine to Asclepius there, you actually can see remnants of the pools that were from the Roman period, from the first century, or actually even earlier than the first century when they were mm -hmm. built. Yeah, and you know, so you, you see this in John chapter five where you know, people are, you know, he's healing and, he, and it labels it right there. And so you can come and you find, talk a little bit about the archeology span there because I think that's a, that's a very prominent example of, of doubt. People reading and going, well, where is it? But then as they get into it, so John describes it as a pool with five stoas. And that was something that was a bit confusing for a lot of scholars because they wondered what kind of shape did this pool have? Was it a type of trapezoid? But when it was excavated, they found not only the steps leading down, like it's talked about in the narrative, but they understood that the, the fifth stoa was actually a dividing stoa between an upper and lower section of the pool. And so it was rectangular with the fifth stoa cutting through the middle of it. And that told us John actually knew what he was talking about. He was there in Jerusalem before 70 AD in the destruction. And so he knew what the pool of Bethesda looked like. And he records those accurate descriptions in his gospel. Yeah. I mean, this is just, just awesome in the sense of uh, what Titus has put here. And to kind of talk about how this, your book is, is unique, because uh, certainly you're not going to write a book that's already been written. So kind of how is your book unique? My approach for this book was not to necessarily replace the other books on the archaeology or history of Jesus, but to do an update on it. So I have a lot of fairly new or recent things in there and some, some research in there that you won't find in some of the other books on the archeology span of Jesus. 
And it's also, it's coming from the perspective that the Gospels are historically accurate. Many of the books on the archaeology of Jesus do not share that perspective. And then also it's coming from the perspective of an archaeologist. And that's also not something that you will find in a lot of the books. Most of the books or many of the books on the archaeology and history of Jesus are written by New Testament scholars that are not archaeologists. So they're familiar with the material, but they themselves aren't intimately familiar with excavating and working it at various sites and archaeological remains. And so I was hoping to bring a bit of a different perspective than many of the books while also updating or giving the newest information that we had, uh, discussing some of the controversial issues like, say, Quirinius or the James ossuary, mm -hmm. and then uh, also bringing in, like you noted, these other historical manuscripts that mention Jesus that are not New Testament manuscripts, most of which are not Christian, and inserting those, and so we can see what the idea of Jesus or about Jesus is for people living in the first and second centuries. You know, as you think about this, again, I hope your heart, is, as well as ours is, is to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ, dying on a cross for our sins and, and resurrected for our justification. And so when you think about that, the goal is evangelism. And so I think this particular book is tremendous and, and think in, maybe it's to strengthen your faith, maybe it's to give it to somebody who, a family, friend, neighbor, whatever, coworker, who's skeptical. And uh, again, even people that I know that have said Jesus didn't even exist, and, and yet what, what Titus has done here is he's provided so much information of the archaeology, but as well as, as we said, the, these other non-biblical um, writings, uh, secular writings that describe events, places, even the person of Jesus or the, the early forms of Christianity in their text uh, describing on location. So it's extremely powerful to, to, to address those people who are skeptical. So we're going to take a little break here and you can see how you can get this, I think, a wonderful book. The excavations in Israel never seem to stop and the things they're finding really are amazing. Of course, we believe in the divine inspiration of the Bible so none of this takes us by surprise. But for much of the world who's never studied the Bible, they look at the Bible through skeptical eyes. The Bible is a book that can be trusted. How do we know that for sure? Biblical archeology span and Bible prophecy. Dr. Kennedy has written two unique books containing hundreds of fascinating discoveries, unearthing the Bible and excavating the evidence for Jesus. Either book is available individually for your gift of $30 or more, with shipping included, as always, anywhere in the USA. These books will strengthen your faith in God's Word. We have a special package offer for you today that will allow you to receive both of Dr. Kennedy's unique books as free bonuses. We've produced two sets of DVDs from some of the top Christian Bible scholars and archaeologists in the world today. Biblical archaeology comes alive. The two six DVD sets include 12 conference messages from men like Randall Price, Michael Lake, Aaron Lipkin, Tim Mahoney, and Tim Alvarino, discussing exciting archaeological discoveries like Noah's Ark, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the location of the Temple Mount. When you order these two DVD sets, We'll send you all 12 DVDs, plus both of Titus Kennedy's books on biblical archaeology as a free bonus, all for your gift of $75 or more to support the important television ministry of Prophecy Watchers. Call us on our toll-free number 24-7 or visit our online bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv. Nothing makes us happier than sharing God's Word with the world. The Bible has been called God's love letter to mankind, sharing the story of where we came from and where we're going, and how you can live forever with Jesus for all eternity. Visit our website and discover for yourself how you can join us in the home God has prepared for those who love Him. Well, I really hope you get the book because I, I know that you will be absolutely blessed. I mean, uh, you're, you, you write certainly with a scholarly flair, but it's, it wasn't um, overly, I would say, pedantic or just dense. I mean, it, it was very easy, to, readable, 
Um, and it was, it was faith affirming, which I appreciated. Uh, in, our, in our last few minutes, um, talk a little bit, maybe a couple of your favorite uh, examples of, of the life of Jesus and the archeological record. One of my favorites is the topic of Quirinius. And so this is often something that scholars will say is an error in the Gospels. Either they say that, that Luke was in error or Matthew was in error. And most, I think, now would lean towards Luke was in error. But there are various sides. And, and the, essentially the argument is that Luke mentions Augustus issuing an empire-wide census, and then Quirinius is the Roman official who is in charge of that in Judea. And they say, that doesn't make sense if Jesus was born before the death of Herod. They say that Josephus talks about Quirinius coming to Judea in 6 AD. And so there was some confusion there. Mm -hmm. But first of all, let's look at Luke. He says, it's an empire-wide census issued by Augustus, right? Well, from Augustus' own records, we know that he did issue three empire-wide censuses during his reign, and the one that would be closest to the birth of Jesus or, or to the death of Herod before the death of Herod was issued in 8 BC. So that's when he gives the proclamation, a little bit of time to get to Judea. It, it fits with the Matthew chronology, right? Now, what about Quirinius? Well, yes, Quirinius did go to Judea later when Archelaus was deposed in 6 AD, but that was a local tax assessment. It was not part of a large empire-wide census, but we do have evidence of Quirinius being in that region, in Syria province and bordering regions, as a commander of legions earlier on, closer to when this, this other census was issued by Augustus. And there's actually a tombstone of one of his officers, his Roman officers, that mentions a census during the time of Augustus and that Quirinius was the one in command and it's in Syria province. And so I think that connects to what Luke is talking about. And I, you know, I explain in the book some other components of the argument why I think Luke is correct there. You know, this is, this is again, the, the awesomeness of, of looking at archaeology and, again, as you do here, the, the historical records, because uh, I think oftentimes if we just wait long enough, uh, other pieces of the puzzle will come out and uh, provide the, the collaboration. That Absolutely. We have. Well, Titus, appreciate you being here. It's gone too quick. And uh, appreciate you writing this book. I mean, this is going to, I think, going to bless so many people. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. So we, again, appreciate your time watching, as always. And, um, you know, I always like to end, just say that, you know, appreciate your prayers and support for what we do here. Uh, there's no doubt uh, the ministry that we are doing is um, not liked by the enemy. Uh, certain attacks that can't go into publicly, but uh, there's no doubt that we appreciate your prayers, knowing that God is, is working and providing and wants us to continue to get the gospel out all around the world in the different places that he's opening up for us. So uh, appreciate your prayers, and we will see you next time. Thank you.